You're listening to Mercy Calling, a podcast presenting prophetic guidance by the scholars and teachers at Dar al-Turath al-Islami in Cape Town, South Africa. This podcast is brought to you by Seekers Hub Global. You can subscribe to this podcast and all of our other podcasts on iTunes, Google Play, and on our website, seekershub.fm. Visit seekershub.org for free online courses, our reliable answer service, and engaging media. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والأقبة للمتقين والجنة للموحدين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وصلاة وسلام على أشرف الخلق والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا وقرتنا وقرة عيننا ونور قلوبنا وسندنا ومولانا محمد صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد أبرز لنص الله سبحانه وتعالى and the choices, salutations upon our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been kind to us once again in allowing us to be part of a class of knowledge, in allowing us to be part of a gathering wherein we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and recite the verses of the glorious Quran. And this morning we introduced and included within our weekly program the recitation of the Al-Hurbul Latif and hopefully every week inshallah ta'ala we can mention a virtue of one of the various adhkar that appears in the Hurbul Latif because as stated previously they are all prophetic adhkar they are all prophetic supplication you will have noticed that one of the adhkar that we recited was not all the adhkar is either recited thrice once or thrice, the Hasbi Allah is seven times, and the Salawat Allah Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is ten times. So it's either once or thrice. But there's one dhikr that we made that was recited four times and not three times. And it actually stands out. Allahumma inni asbahtu ushiduka wa ushidu hamalata arshika wa malaikataka wa jami'a falkika annaka anta Allah. لا إله إلا أنت وحدك لا شريك لك وأن سيدنا محمدا أنتك ورسوله فالرب صلى الله عليه وسلم تورت السرسان أو الله أصبحت آل إنت الموني أشهد أشهدك making you witness أي شاهد be a testament وأشهد حملة عرشك I make the candles of your throne be a testament وملائكتك and all your angels I make them all be a testament أَنَّكَ أَنْتَ اللَّهُ That you are Allah. أَنَّكَ أَنْتَ اللَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ There is no deity of God but you. وَحْدَكَ alone. لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ You have no partners. وَأَنَّ سَيِّدَنَا And that our master, Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم is your servant and messenger. صلى الله عليه وسلم. The Prophet said صلى الله عليه وسلم the person who recites it once, one quarter of his body, he set free from the fire of Jahannam. And the one who recites it twice, another quote of him, he set free from the fire of Jahannam, which means half of you have been set free from the fire of Jahannam. And the one who recites it thrice, three quote of him or her has been set free from the fire of Jahannam. And therefore we cannot stop at three. Because while I have to stop at three, I'm 75% free from Jahannam, but 25% of mine is still the potential is for God to Jahannam. And therefore we recite it four times because when we recite it for the fourth time, when we die, your body becomes haram to Jahannam. So whoever dies in a day when he recited, Allahumma inni asbahtu ushiduka wa ushidu hamanata arshika wa malaikataka wa jami'a khalkik anta ka anta Allah la ila illa anta wahdaka la shirika la kuanna sayyidina muhammadan amduka wa rasuluh whoever dies in a day when he recited this four times, as haram to God to Jahannam. And whoever died in the evening, when he recited this four times, before Maghrib or after Maghrib, it's haram for him to go to Jahannam. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us punctual in reciting these adhkar, so that we can be protected from his ultimate punishment, which is Jahannam. But there are different forms of punishment that we see and witness within this world, and the one who is punctual in reciting this compilation of adhkar will be protected from all types of punishment. By the one who legislated these adhkar, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today, we continue with our discussion on the best females that ever lived in this world. 
commenting on the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that the best woman of all of existence, khayr nisa al alami, are four. And the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that it is Asiya bint Muzahi, Maryam, at Asiya the daughter of Muzahi, Maryam the daughter of Imran, Khadija bint Khuwaili. And Fatima to bin to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and the virtue of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha over all other women is like the virtue of the special dish known as tari over all other types of food. And that's we commenting on the lives of these five women, these five female giants, and drawing lessons from their lives. Last week I may have indicated that we're going to commence with a discussion on the life of uh, Maryam alayhi salam. However, chronologically, we know that who came first, Maryam or Asya? Asya came before Maryam. How do you know that? Because Asya was the wife of Fir'aun and she was a stepmother of, of sorts to Nabi Musa. And Nabi Musa came before Nabi Isa. And Maryam was the mother of Nabi Isa. So, because we want to follow, we commit with Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, because we want to start this program, this program of series with the blessing and the barakah of the most beloved of all women to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that was Khadija. And we are going to now follow the chronological order by beginning our discussion with Asiya. And after Asiya, Maryam. And eventually you'll we'll be speaking about the life and lessons from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And you'll come to learn that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was an absolutely amazing personality. And then we conclude this particular series with the life of that which was part of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Fatima al Batul al Zahra. But today we're speaking about Asiya. And the entire life of Sayyidina Asiya. May Allah be well pleased with the ties into the life of Nabi Musa alayhi salatu wa salam. But when speaking of Nabi Musa alayhi salatu wa salam, it's important for us to appreciate that there was another lady that played a major role in his life. A lady whose role was so amazing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned her and spoke of her in the glorious Quran. And that lady of course was the mother of Nabi Musa. Now, it's rather interesting because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the mother of Nabi Musa as Ummu Musa. وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ We have revealed or inspired the mother of Musa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give us her name. So, the scholars they debated regarding the name of the mother of Nabi Musa. And the names of it are challenging to remember, so I just made a note of them. One suggestion said that her name was Ayarqa. One says just Yarqa. Another says Ayadat. Another opinion said that the name of Nabi Musa was Yuhanda. Another says Loha. And another says Loha. Another says Baduna. So, different opinions existed regarding the name of Nabi Musa. The two famous names of him was Ayarqa. And the other famous name was Yuhand, with the dad at the end. But nonetheless, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referred to her as the mother of Nabi Musa, and that suffices. Sayyidatina Aisha Asiya, as well as the mother of Nabi Musa, they lived in very challenging times. Challenging because we all know that Israel, Nabi Israel, who knows what the name of Prophet Israel was? Nabi Yaqub. Nabi Yaqub had 12 sons. Those 12 sons of Nabi Yaqub eventually became the 12 tribes, famous tribes of the Banu Israel. Nabi Yaqub's name was Israel in Hebrew. Isra meant Ab. Isra translates as Ab, which is a slave. And Il in the Hebrew language translates as God. So Israel means Abdullah. And Nabi Yaqub was a slave of Allah. And therefore his name was Israel. His children, of course, were known as Banu Israel, 
One of his children stood out, and that was Nabi Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. The story of Nabi Yusuf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referred to it, referred to it in the glorious Quran as Ahsan al-Qasas, the best of stories. And I had no doubt that our sisters heard the story of Nabi Yusuf. Eventually what happened was, after Nabi Yusuf was established within the kingdom within Egypt, or Cairo, then Islam, or rather true religion of believing in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the prophethood of Nabi Yusuf remained within Egypt, especially among the Banu Israel. But as time passed, people distanced themselves from the teachings of the religion and the practices of the religion until eventually the majority of Banu Israel they drift, drifted from the true path. And a few generations later, we find that the kings of Egypt they adopted the laqab, the name or the title <coughs> Fir'aun. And eventually we find ourselves in the time of Fir'aun, who was the wife of Asia, the Fir'aun of the time of Nabi Musa, alayhi salatu wasalam. We find ourselves in his time, and what happened? He claimed to be God. He claimed to be the creator of the universe. He claimed to be in charge. He claimed that everything belongs to him. That's how far people drifted from the teachings of Nabi Yusuf, from the teachings of Nabi Yaqub. Not only, not only Fir'aun himself, but the inhabitants, many of them believed him to be God. And that was the state of affairs. And at this time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to send a prophet. Now, Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam already, he made this claim, or not this claim, this prophecy. When Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam passed through Egypt, the king of Egypt tried adopting and taking one of his wives as a slave. Right? And he wanted to have conjugal relations with her. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected Nabi Ibrahim, protected his wife. Because of that, Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam made a statement that from my offspring there will be a prophet and through that prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove the control of the kingdom of Egypt from the king of Egypt. Now that is a very important message why? Because when the Banu Israel was under oppression, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the story is related beautifully at the beginning of Surah Al-Qasas. And you can pick up the Quran and go to Surah Al-Qasas and read these beautiful verses for yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began the surah saying, Those are the uh, cut up letters. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best regarding its meaning. Ma anzalna alaykal tilka ayatul kitab al These are verses or signs, verses of a clear book, al kitab al mubi Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commences this chapter, which is full of stories of Anbiya. Allah begins, it with this, begins the chapter with the story of Nabi Musa. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, نَبْلُوا عَلَيْكَ مِنْ نَبَلِ مُوسَى وَفِرْعَوْنَ بِالْحَقِّ لِقَوْمِ يُؤْمِنُونَ We will now relate to you the story of Nabi Musa and Fir'aun. For a nation that believe, إِنَّ فِرْعَوْنَ عَلَى فِي الْأَرْضِ Fir'aun kept himself high. Takabba, he had kibar, he had worthiness. He considered himself great to the extent that he considered himself to be God. إِنَّ فِرْعَوْنَ عَلَى فِي الْأَرْضِ وَجَعَلَ أَهْلَهَا شِيَعًا He placed the people of Egypt into groups. So he put the Banu Israel one side and the Coptics on another side. And the Banu Israel were downtrodden. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, يَسْتَوْعِفُ طَائِفَةَ بِهُمْ He humiliated, he looked down upon and considered one party to be inferior. And that was the Banu Israel. When in reality, the Banu Israel were the best people of the earth at the time. The best people on earth at the time was the children of Israel. Of course, in general, the children of Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, but specifically the children of Israel. <laughs> and he considered them to be downtrodden. And they were oppressed, and they were working for Fir'aun. They were like slaves in the kingdom of Fir'aun. Yudabbih abna'ahu, Fir'aun was slaughtering their children, and we'll come to speak about that in a moment. وَيَسْتَحِينِ سَاءَهُمْ And he kept the human folk alive. إِنَّهُ كَانَ مِنَ الْمُسِيرِينَ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is nothing more beautiful than His words. There is no, 
There's no more profound way in terms of expression than the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expresses himself. So Allah said that when we read anna munna al ardi, when we read anna munna al ladina sul'ifu fil ardi, we then desire to favor those that party that was belittled and humiliated. And we wanted to make them, desire to make them leaders. And we wanted to make them, desire to make them heirs. Heirs of property. And we wanted to make them, desire to make them firm upon this earth. And this is beautiful. And we wanted to show Fir'aun and his minister Haman. What you do to Haman is the armies of Fir'aun and Haman. We wanted to show them that which they feared. So what were they fearing? They were fearing that because Fir'aun had a dream. And in the dream, Fir'aun sees a fire coming into Egypt and wiping out Egypt. So he goes to his cabinet that he consults with, which is predominantly Coptic, and they inform him that the Banu Israel that we are oppressing, they are speaking about the dua that the grandfather of Ibrahim made that Allah will send among them a prophet that will remove the kingdom of Egypt. And they are speaking about that prophet coming now. And that's they interpret the dream of Fir'aun, not because they had knowledge of interpretation, but because they heard that the Banu Israel was speaking about the coming of a prophet. So Fir'aun, his strategy and plan is that all young boys that are born should be killed. All infants, all children, young boys that are born should be killed. But of course, when Fir'aun starts killing children, the ministers come to him again. And they say to him, Fir'aun, you are killing all the young men of the Banu Israel, all the newly born children, and the workers of the Banu Israel, that is, our slaves in this dynasty, that are building whatever we require to build and all types of labor, they are becoming old. <coughs> if you remove an entire generation, if you kill all the youngsters, we might be weakening the Banu Israel, but who's going to do our work for us? So Fir'aun then established a rule that one year, boys will be killed, and the next year they'll be allowed to live. In that way, Fir'aun thought that the Banu Israel will remain weak, and they'll never be able to reach so much strength to take over my kingdom, and at the same time, I will be ensuring that there are laborers within our community and society until I no longer imagine. So Nabi Harun was born the one year when children or young boys were allowed to live. Young infants were allowed to live. That's when the elder brother Nabi Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, Harun was born. The following year, however, was the year when every male child should be killed. And That's the year that Nabi Musa alayhi salatu was born. Now, what speaks of the piety and what speaks of the taqwa and the closeness that the mother of Nabi Musa has with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the experiences that she has already while being pregnant with Nabi Musa. Remember that Fir'aun has spies. Most of the time, these spies they take the form of, of, of nurses, or wet nurses, that are receiving children. So they know who's pregnant, and they know who's giving birth, and they know when there's a male, and they inform the army, and the army will come and they'll kill the child. But as far as the mother of Nabi Musa والسلام, is concerned, the first miracle is that she was pregnant, up until nine months, but the pregnancy did not show. So no one in the area could actually see that she was pregnant. Number one. Number two is the midwife that eventually received Nabi Musa when he was born. They all spies. Every midwife has her function and duty to report immediately once the child is born that it's a male and this is the year of killing. The army should come out and the child should be killed. But one of the miracles of Nabi Musa was that Allah said, this is Surah Taha, 
وألقيت عليك محبة مني. وإذا لقيت النبي موسى لم يكن. Allah said, I have caused upon you love from me. And the scholars of Tafsir, they say what that means is that whoever saw Nabi Musa fell in love with him. So when the mother of Nabi Musa gave birth and the midwife deceived Nabi Musa and saw him, she fell in love with him. And because nobody really knew she was pregnant because her pregnancy was hidden, the midwife said, how can I be the cause of such a child being killed? So the midwife kept it a secret. And of course, Nabi Musa salam's mother kept it a secret. And nobody knew that she was pregnant and nobody knew that she gave birth. But now, it's very challenging. Why is it challenging? Because she has a child with her. And she loves her child. Like any mother would love her child. And she has to interact with her baby in such a manner that nobody knows that she has a child. But how does she do that? How does she stop the baby from crying? How does she fulfill the baby's need? When there's people all around her. One of the methods she used when people came, when people sort of had an inkling of an idea that she might have a child, the, the box, the taboo to which she eventually places the baby Musa was not a box that she just created for the occasion. No, she had it for some time with her. So when people came to check whether she had a child, she would have now the Musa placed in this box. And the box would float. She lived on the bank of the Nile River. She would place the child in the box, tie the box to a rope that would be tied and connected to some tree or something close to her home. And that's when everyone leaves after checking whether she had a child or not. She would pull the box in and then she would continue breastfeeding and taking care of the child. <laughs> An amazing strategy. And this was for how long? The scholars estimate for approximately four months she was able to keep Nabi Musa hidden. However, as the child is growing, things are becoming more challenging. The main lesson to be taken really from the mother of Nabi Musa and this was one of her nicknames. Her nickname was much more easier to remember than one of her actual names. One of her nicknames was Al Mutawakina, the one who placed the trust in Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَأُوحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ Now, أُوحَيْنَا means we reveal. But reveal should not be understood here as revelation. Because we know that the mother of Nabi Musa, for sure, by agreement, was not a prophet. There was debate about Sayyidina Mariam alayhi salatu wa salam, but regarding the mother of Nabi Musa, there is agreement that she was not a prophet of God. And yet Allah said, we reveal to her. And therefore, what reveal here means is that there's two possibilities. The one is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired her. And that happens still today. Right? Within the Ummah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there are men of piety that receive inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inspiration would come in various forms. One form of inspiration would be a dream. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would show advice individuals, send him or her a message in a dream. So that was the one possibility. Another possibility is that an angel could have came to and told her that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala conveys this message to you. That's another type of inspiration. And that all speaks of a state of, of high spirituality. In other words, we have no doubt that the mother of Nabi Musa was one of the great salihat of this ummah. So she was inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa awhayna ila ummi Musa. We inspired the mother of Musa. And ardi'ihi. This is such a beautiful verse. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the mother of Nabi Musa two commands. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes two prohibitions and Allah gives her two glad tidings. So the first thing, the two commands, Allah said, Ardi'ihi, breastfeed. And this was a hikmah. Because the time when the child is most in need of the breast milk of his mother is that first period of approximately four months. And therefore, for four months, his own mother breastfeed him before he lived. And I, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said فَإِنْ خِفْتِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَلْقِيهِ فِي الْيَمْ When you start fearing, in other words, when the pressure becomes too much for you to keep your child hidden from the public and from the army, then cast him in the river, the river now. In, in, in Surah Taha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said أَنِقْضِ فِيهِ فِي التَّابُوتِ فَقْضِ فِيهِ فِي الْيَمْ Place him in a box 
and then place this box into the water, into the nam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the two commands was breastfeed him and then cast him or place him in the river. وَوَحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ أَرْضِعِيهِ فَإِنْخِفْتِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَلْقِيهِ فِي الْيَامِ Now, this was an unbelievable stance because the mothers that are present here, you would know what the child means to you. And how does a lady bring herself to a point where she can actually place her child in a box, in a river, and just put the trust in Allah thereafter. You know, if, if, if someone was to create a story using his imagination, he couldn't have created such a story. Like really, if this wasn't a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our response would be, this is a fairy tale. How does a mother take a child, place a child in a box and leave it to flow on the Nile River? Right? But she's been inspired. So the commands was to do that. That was the two commands. The prohibitions was, وَلَا تَخَافِي Do not fear. وَلَا تَحْزَنِي Do not experience grief. And that's another sign that she was from the saints. Because the quality of the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was such that Allah said about them, أَلَا إِنَّ أَوْلِيَا اللَّهِ Indeed, the friends of Allah, لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ They have no fear and they experience no grief. So Allah said to her, وَلَا تَخَافِي Do not have fear. وَلَا تَحْزَنِي Do not have grief. And she had no fear and she had no grief. She was content with the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She understood that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can take far greater and better care of Nabi Musa, but she can. So mother should learn to place a trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you send your child out, be it to school or madrasa, and you put your trust, you take the necessary precautions, and your child leaves home, you should learn to put your trust in Allah. And believe that your child is under the care of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَا تَحْزَنِ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, two commands, two prohibitions. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives her two glad tidings. Allah says to her, إِنَّ رَادُّهُ إِلَيْكِ We will return her to you. وَجَاعِلُوهُ مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ And we were making from the prophets. <laughs> so, the mother of Nabi Musa, she places him in the box. She lets the box free on the river of Anar, putting a trust in Allah. However, she says to her daughter, Nabi Musa had a sister. The name of the sister was Kumthum. Nabi Musa's sister, her name was Kumthum. So she said to her daughter Kumthum, وَقَالَتْ لِأُخْتِهِ she said to the sister of Nabi Musa, Qussihi. Qussihi means to follow him. Follow and see where your brother is going. فَبَصُرَ بِهِ عَنْ جُنُبٍ وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ From a distance, she was observing Nabi Musa alayhi salatu wasalam and they did not know. They did not perceive that she was observing and they did not perceive that she was his sister. Until eventually she is observing the box and the river Nile as best as possible until what happened? The mother is fearing who? Fir'aun. The mother is fearing that if Fir'aun gets my son, Fir'aun is going to kill my son. And the daughter observes that the box eventually finds itself making its way into a garden of Fir'aun that reaches out into the Nile. And there's different narrations. One narration says that Fir'aun was sitting with his wife Asiya on the porch looking into the river now when they observed this box. And as he has sent some of the females that were uh, serving her to go and fetch the box. So when Kulthum, Nabi Musa's sister, witness and observes this, she's going back to her mother. And she's saying, my dearest mother, what we feared most happened, the box went to the palace of Fir'aun. <laughs> we were trying to protect the child from Fir'aun, and the box went to the palace of Fir'aun. You know, that's just amazing. But when the child, the box is brought to Asia, and we're going to be speaking about Asia, 
and she opens up the box and she sees them in Musa alayhi salatu wa salam. What did he say about him? وَأَلْقَيْتُ عَلَيْكَ مَحَبَّةً Whoever of saw and observed than in Musa fell in love with him. Because Allah said, we placed upon him our love and thus whoever saw him loved him. حُبِّبَ إِلَىٰ عِبَادِ اللَّهِ Whoever had a pure heart and saw Nabi Musa loved him. So immediately when Asiya saw Nabi Musa, she fell in love with him. And even though she knew that according to the law of a husband, this child has to be killed, because the child might be from the Banu Israel, she went to him and she said to him that, Qurratu Aini Li Walak. This is the coolness of my eyes and your eyes. Fir'aun had a child with Asa. Asa had a child, a daughter. And the daughter of Asa, she had a skin disease. Some scholars say that she had leprosy. When Asiya received Nabi Musa as a young child, she could see that this is a special child. And it's a blessed child. And she took from the saliva of Nabi Musa and placed it on the sores on the body of her daughter and she was healed. So she said, look at this boy. He healed your daughter. Number one. He will be the coolness of my eyes and the coolness of your eyes. You know, she was convincing Fir'aun that this child should not be killed. So, Fir'aun actually had a response. Fir'aun said to her that, Qurratu Aini Lak. He said that he may be the coolness of your eyes, but not mine. So, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu is said in a hadith that if on the day when Fir'aun met Nabi Musa, if he, if, he, if he accepted the statement of his wife Asiya, that Nabi Musa would be the fullness of her eyes as well as his eyes, he would have become a believer and he would have believed in Nabi Musa. But because he rejected Nabi Musa at that time, he was then destined to be a disbeliever and he was destined to become from the coal of, coal of the fire of Jannah. Therefore, it's so important that one uh, realizes opportunities in one see opportunities. Number one. Number two, it's so important that when we are told or meet individuals that are listed among the pious of this woman, even if I have doubts, I protect my tongue. Because I may say something out of anger or out of ignorance, and that word of mine will come to haunt me for the rest of my life. So be very careful what you have to say about any of the saints of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that مَنْ آذَانِ وَلِيًّا Whoever harms any of my friends, any of my saints, any of the salihin, فَقَدْ آذَنْتُمُ بِالْحَرْبْ I declare war against such a person. And therefore, we fear for those people that do not protect their tongues when they come to the pious servants, the elect servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fir'aun did not control his tongue. Fir'aun's statement wasn't even a harsh, harsh statement. Fir'aun just said, he is the coolness of your eyes, but not necessarily the coolness of my eyes. Which compared to the type of statements that people are making regarding the saints of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala today is very mad. He said, the coolness of your eyes, not the coolness of my eyes. And because of that, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, because of that statement, he was declared to be from the disbelievers in Nabi Musa alayhi salatu wa salam, and he was destined to the fire of Jahannam. Had he accepted and said that Nabi Musa is the coolness of my eyes as well, and seen that opportunity, and showed respect and adab to the young Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would have been saved. And therefore we should be very, very, very careful what we say about the select servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make us So Asiya, she now falls in love with Nabi Musa, she adopts Nabi Musa, she convinces her husband that Nabi Musa has to be their child and live in their palace. <laughs> and this is all the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَالْتَقَطَهُ آلُ فِرْعَوْنَ لِيَكُونَ لَهُمْ عَدُوًا وَحَزَنًا إِنَّ فِرْعَوْنَ وَهَمَانَ وَجْلُودَهُمَا كَانُوا خَاطِئِينَ وَقَالَ فِي مَرَأَةُ فِرْعَوْنَ فِرْعَوْنَ كُرَّةُ عِيْنِ لِي وَلَكْ لَا تَقْتُلُوهُ دُنَا كِلِهِمْ 
عسى أن ينفعنا perhaps he will benefit us أو نتخذه ولدا and we could take him as a as a son وهم لا يشعرون now Fir'aun agrees Kulthum Nabi Musa's sister observed that Nabi Musa now her young brother baby brother of four months old he went into the palace of Fir'aun he brings this news to his mother and because she is a mother and mothers are compassionate immediately she goes into a state of frenzy she goes into a state of worry so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَأَصْبَحْ فُؤَادُ أُمِّ مُوسَى فَارِقًا the mother of Nabi Musa then her heart becomes void of everything else besides her son Nabi Musa that's the one interpretation there's two interpretations I'll give you the first interpretation her heart became void of everything else and all she could think about was her son Nabi Musa who is now in the palace of the enemy what's going to happen to my son will he survive <laughs> and that was a serious concern because even though Asiya loved Nabi Musa the young Nabi Musa she still had to argue and make a case by Fir'aun. And Fir'aun did not give her an easy time. In one narration, the army wanted to take hold of Nabi Musa and have him killed. And then she got into a quarrel with the army, said, wait for my husband, if my husband takes this decision. So Asiya played a major role in the preservation of the life of Nabi Musa. So imagine, if Asiya was worried about Nabi Musa, who was in her arms, whom she is trying to defend, can you imagine the state of the mother, who would be attaching herself to the child of a period of woman after carrying the child for nine months. So, وَأَصْبَحَ فُؤَالِ أُمُّ مُوسَى فَارِغَةً The heart of the mother of Nabi Musa became void of everyone but Nabi Musa. إِنْ كَادَتْ لَتُبْدِي بِهِ She nearly could not control herself and was about to start shouting out to people that my son has been taken by Fir'aun, my son has been taken by Fir'aun. Right? Another interpretation of وَأَصْبَحَ فُؤَالِ أُمَّ مُوسَى فَارِغَةً is that some scholars have, even though they were a minority, the opinion is still so carried away, was that when she came to realize the danger that Nabi Musa is in, her heart became void of everyone and everything but Allah. And she placed her faith and her trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the next thing is amazing. The sister of Nabi Musa continues observing. And she notices now that the young baby needs to drink. So all the burdi'at, the, the ladies that are breastfeeding, within the palace they are called. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has it such that Nabi Musa cannot drink from anyone. Every lady that comes to him and wants to breastfeed him, he is not willing to drink. So Allah said in the Quran, وَحَرَّمْنَا عَلَيْهِ الْمَرَاضِيَ مِنْ قَبْلِ Every lady that was brought to him, he refused, rejected, refused, rejected, refused, rejected. Until everyone was tested in the palace. So they said, we need to go beyond the palace. And they started calling women from outside. And every lady that can, every lady wants to be the one that breastfeeds the child of Asiya, the wife of Firam. Because there's going to be reward, you can live in the palace, there's luxury for you. And the child refuses. And then the sister Nabi Musa, she says to them that هَلْ أَدُلُّكُمْ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِ بَيْتِ يَكْفُلُونَهُ لَكُمْ Can I point out to your family that will be able to breastfeed this child? And they say to her that right now we're running out of options. If you know a lady that breastfeeds, bring the lady and we can try. So she runs home, she gets her mother and she brings the mother into the palace of her mother. Look, look, look at Allah's plan. <laughs> but I'm saying that if someone was to create the story, you would have seen it's a fairy tale. Had it not been mentioned in the Quran, we have believed it. The lady that was fearing for nine months from Fir'aun, and then for four months thereafter, and then she went into a state of frenzy when she came to learn my son is in the home of Fir'aun, she now hopes, contented, happy, with confidence, into the palace of Fir'aun. And immediately when she tries to breastfeed Nabi Musa, breastfeed Nabi Musa, he starts thinking. So Asiya says to the mother of Nabi Musa, will you please come live in our palace and breastfeed my child? So she says, I cannot. 
I have a husband at home and I have children at home. Who is going to take care of me if I was to live in your family? But if you wish, your child can come stay with me and I will take care of him. And when the breastfeeding period ends, you could have him back. So Asya, she's so thankful and grateful. She says, please take care of my child for me. And I will visit him on a regular basis. And then she takes Nabi Musa with her back home. And Allah's promise becomes true. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna raduhu ilayki. We will replace him in the box. Let the now take him with an iron is flowing. And we will return him to you. The idea here is to have yaqeen, conviction in the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will return him to you. Then that will happen. Whether the story becomes whether the story becomes like a fairy tale or not, everything is in Allah's power. Inna ra'aduhu ilayki wa ja'iru min al So she takes the child with the home, and now the state of the home changes. A silver tag, 712-774. In church street, one of the doors is open. Please check up on the form and public. A silver tag, 712-774. So, She's now, the child is back home in his mother's home, where he used to be. The same spies that was looking for the child, Allah subhanahu, subhanahu wa ta'ala now made it such that they guarding the child. Because this is now the child of Asiya, the child of Fir'aun. They were living in very difficult circumstances. She barely had money to take care of the child. Now, every month and every week, Funds is coming in from the palace of Fir'aun and food is coming in from the palace of Fir'aun and provisions is coming from the palace of Fir'aun and they're being treated as royalty in her own home while she's taking care of Nabi Musa. And then beyond that, beyond that, the mother of Nabi Musa is getting paid for breastfeeding her own child. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then provides through this incident and through this happening Allah provides for the entire family of Nabi Musa. Mother, father, children, everyone is taken care of because they are busy taking care of the son of Asia, the wife of Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So return him to his mother so that the eyes may become cool. The coolness of the eyes is an expression that speaks of joy and happiness and contentment. So that the eyes could be captured, so that she could become content. تحزن, and that she experiences no grief. وَلِتَعْلَمْ And so that she can come to know. And so that you and I can come to know. So that the Ummah and everyone that reads the story can come to know أَنَّ وَعْدَ اللَّهِ حَقٌّ That the promise of Allah is true. أَنَّ وَعْدَ اللَّهِ حَقٌّ that the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is true and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said وَلَكِنَّ أَكْتَرَهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُ But most of humanity, they do not know that the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is true. And the lesson that we take from the life of the mother of Nabi Musa alayhi salatu wasalam and how Nabi Musa eventually ends up in the palace of Fir'aun is a lesson that we need to place conviction in the word of Allah. We need to have conviction in the promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one of those promises are, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that when we say ever, Allah grants three daughters. And the father, and for that fact even the mother, takes care of those daughters, and looks after those daughters, and ensures that they get a good upbringing, an upbringing that draws them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam takhalu jannah wa inta jannah. The companions said, what if I have two daughters here, Rasulullah? So they said, the same behold is for the one who takes care of two daughters. And then they said, what if I have one daughter here, Rasulullah? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, even if you have one daughter and you want to take proper care of her and ensure that she gets a good and proper upbringing, the reward for that is nothing but jannah. And that's one example. So we, as the mothers that are present, and the sisters that would be mothers should feel that these promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are true. But I need to reach out to Allah and I need to connect to Him as how the mother of Nabi Musa connected to Him. And we'll see amazing miracles within our lives. 
we'll see amazing things happening within our life. And there are countless of examples of this. When a mother carries human, when a mother carries concern, when a mother has true concern for her children, there's, there's, a, there's a value of clip. Because among the our scholars, the, among the Salihin in general, especially in the Ba'alawi family, there are a number of incidents where a child is born knowing an X number of Jews in the Quran. Some of the Salihin, their children were born and the child was half in the Quran. And so that sounds far fetched. Some children were born and they were half in the number of chapters of the Quran. But because it's things on the past, we're always very hasty, hastily we reject these, these incidents. But today, there's a, you could log on to YouTube, and there's a boy, I think three years of age, and he can barely pronounce the words of the Quran correctly because he's stunned and he's, his speech is still developing. But he can recite the entire Surah Maryam by memory. And the reason why he can recite Surah Maryam by memory is because during the pregnancy, while his mother was pregnant with him, she recited Surah Maryam every day. And because she recited Surah Maryam every day, and that was because of the intense love for Surah Maryam, when the child was born, the child knew Surah Maryam. When she recited to him of the born, the child in his baby language used to recite with her. And as soon as the child was able to pronounce words, as our child of three years old, three years old, three years of age, can begin pronouncing words, the head on television is the entire Surah Maryam from him. <laughs> so if the mother adopts key towards the fetus within her and the child within her and the child there afterwards, you know, we, we can observe and see miracles in this world. The same miracles that, that the mother of Nabi Musa witnessed within her child, with her son Nabi Musa, when she turned to Allah, and she connected to Allah, and she placed her trust in Allah, and she believed in the promises of Allah, our sisters today could work the similar miracles, and similar events, and similar happenings. But what's required of us is to, to turn to Allah. The, the mother of our teacher said, Habib Umar, when, when she was a, when her children were still young, she picked up her one child, his name, is, his name was Ali, and she said to him, that you may to be the Mufti of Tariq. And today, Habib Ali Mashur is the most senior Mufti in Habramaw, never mind Tariq. When she picked up Habib Umar, she said to him, the young Umar, that you may to be a caller to Allah. And today, in all of Yemen, the most prominent caller to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so much so that he's listed as the 30 odd most influential Muslim in the world today, is Habib Umar. And that was the dua of a mother. So mothers could do amazing things. If mothers learn to connect to Allah, mothers could change societies, mothers could change the world. But you need to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and believe in His promises and have confidence in His promises, belief and conviction. So now what we have is Nabi Musa is in the palace of Fir'aun. After two years, he returns to the palace. Fir'aun is now taking care of him. That child, Fir'aun, Fearing that child that will take over his kingdom, he killed thousands of children. Thousands. It's just it's unbelievable that you can have an army when every year that happiness has entered their home because a new child is coming to that home, the army arrives, take the child, have the child killed. Today, today, sometimes when we see how our Muslim brothers are being oppressed around the globe, it's just beyond imagination. How can the world observe such oppression? In the time of Fir'aun, it was 100,000 times worse. When the joy of happiness came into a home, when there's a newborn, the army knocks on your door, removes your child, and has a child killed. And thousands and thousands and thousands of children have been killed because Fir'aun is fearing that child that will eventually become a prophet and will take over his kingdom. And then after killing thousands and thousands of children, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows Fir'aun that you are not king. And you are not in charge. After you kill thousands of my creation, I will now get that individual that is going to grow up to become a prophet and remove your kingdom from you, I will let him grow up in your palace. You will get his food, breakfast, lunch and supper from your income. You will be eating from your kitchen. 
Your cooks will be preparing food for him. Your staff will ensure that he grows up becoming a man of intelligence and energy. And after you make effort in seeing to the upbringing of the child, we will give him prophethood. And he will come back and remove your kingdom from you. And this is my decree. And no matter what your own imagines he can do, and whatever Haman imagines he can do, no one can stand in the way of the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the one. So Fir'aun was in his palace, sorry, Asi was in the palace, she had her role to play. And she went through, she was, as you come to mention next week, that Khadija was the first believer, Asi was the first person to accept, was in the palace in the kingdom. When Ali Musa eventually comes back with a message, and we'll speak more about this next week, she was the first to accept the message. Because she saw Nabi Musa growing up in front of her. And when he came to speak about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, immediately she accepted. And when she accepted, there was consequences. There was servants in the palace of their own, alongside Asia, that accepted. When they accepted, there were consequences. When they accepted Islam, when they accepted the, the religion of Nabi Musa, they kept it discreet for as long as possible. And then eventually, there was punishment, there was torture, there was steadfastness, there was amazing events, amazing courage that we witness within these females. And when we meet next week, we in the life subhanahu wa ta'ala, we speak about this amazing role, the steadfastness, the conviction of Asia, which eventually caused her to become one of the best women to have ever lived in this world. So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it possible for us to meet next week and to speak about this great personality. And we've reached now 11.32. So, if there are any questions, we'll take some questions. And thereafter, we will conclude. Thank you for listening to Mercy Calling, the Darut Turath al-Islami podcast. If you like this podcast, we'd appreciate if you left us a review on iTunes and Google Play. Help Seekers Hub build a global Islamic seminary and spread the light of guidance to millions around the world by supporting us through monthly donations by going to seekershub.org donate. Your donations are tax deductible in the U.S. and Canada.